Welcome back. We have traveled over to the, uh, the scanning room, as you'll notice in front of me. This is where the patient would lie down on his or her back. The head goes here. I'll step aside, doctor. The rest is yours. Tell us what happens after that. Okay. Um, so before the patient actually comes in, um, the patient actually goes through a couple of testings, different kind of uh, um, ways to stimulate the brain or relax in the brain. Uh, the, for the purpose of what we do, there are two parts to the spec scan. Uh, there's one part that is called resting state, where it's just kind of relaxing, a, a, a call to calm your brain. And there's another part where we actually stimulate the brain by having them playing this really annoying, annoying game. <laughs> okay. And that really gets your brain going. And then we inject the uh, regular pharmaceutical and that chain, you know, obviously flows into the brain. And then the, this is a, a, it's called a three-headed camera. Uh, most spec scanners are uh, what's called two-headed cameras, but this is actually an older model, but it's actually three-headed. And three-heads are great because you get more signal, so the resolution is much, much higher. And I think that's one of the reasons why we can actually see the kind of detail we can see with the brain and the flow and then all the different areas of the brain uh, parenchyma that we can use to, you know, make the diagnosis. So a patient kind of, you know, goes in here and kind of this will kind of slide inside this little triangle. They just lie down and close your eyes and kind of relax, and some people fall asleep. Do you give them any headphones with music or anything like no, that? No, some, people, just, yeah, some okay. people want that, but uh, generally just lying still, is, the room's kind of dark and quiet, and they kind of fall asleep. And, and they're in there for how long? Oh, about 15 minutes. Okay. Yeah, about 15 minutes, and the scan is done, and 24 hours later, we'll do the second part, depending on which way we go. And that's pretty much it. And then we have a computer system in the control room that takes all the data and, and you know, uh, modifies it, and again, we get the pictures that we need to make the diagnosis. But the overall process, I mean, really is, is painless. I do a couple of little tiny little needle injections for getting the, you know, isotope inside. But other than that, I mean, there's really no, you know, dyes or anything, you know, kind of problems that you know, people may have with, you know, other tests. You know, um, I think we're aware of some allergic problems that with some contrast dyes in CAT scan and MRI. But we really don't have that with, uh, with the study. This is actually a functional analysis. So we're actually looking at the flow of the brain, brain flow inside, you know, uh, inside the brain parenchyma, and uh, depending on you know different areas of the brain, whether it's acting or being active, or you know less than active, the brain flow changes. And by looking at that distribution and these cameras detect those kind of changes in the brain, we're able to make some objective diagnosis and, and analysis of the brain and how that may relate, you know, to the different problems that people may have. Now, this is primarily for adults, I would imagine, men and women, but I mean, if you had a young child, maybe had a headache, brought into your office, you find a malignant tumor or something like that, will something like this spot something like that, or is that usually done through an MRI? Generally an MRI. Okay. That would be a much better way to do that. Okay. Yeah, generally I kind of limit the scanning more towards older children, right now, maybe teenagers, you know, from 13 on. Uh, sometimes I'll go down a little lower, depending on, on the patient, how they, uh, you know, how they're able to actually lie still. That's really a big factor. What's the most fascinating thing? you have found that maybe you didn't expect to find that when you pulled the patient back out said thank you very much mm -hmm. and you suddenly looked at yeah, different colors right. and made you go oh my gosh i didn't yeah. expect this yeah I, I think a lot of it has to do with unexpected areas the brain distribution we have of course the clinical data and all the history and all those things so when we do the test we have some preconception of well this patient may have this and such and such we all do that but uh coming out afterwards you see areas like wow I didn't expect this area of the brain to be, you know, functioning too much or too little. So that, you know, when, when I have the consultation afterwards, is really gratifying to say, hey, you know, we, you know, I saw th something like this in your history, and I didn't really see it, but based on the scan, I think you have a predisposition towards this that we didn't really suspect. We can be more objective and say, we think you have this. Let's talk about altering your treatment or doing something more focused this way. And I think that's really an important gratifying thing. Fascinating. Just, yeah. Absolutely fascinating.